Hello everyone, Sir Midnight here. I just wanted to say that I just created a Patreon page, and you can go there today, and for only $5 a month, you can get special access to my episodes early, and bonus episodes whenever I create them. By becoming an early access patron, you will be able to listen to my episodes a day or two days in advance. The files will not include music, sound effects, or anything special. Just you and my voice to soothe your soul. A complete raw file of the entire episode. So if you would like to support me and get access to those early episodes, go to www.patreon.com slash Sir Midnight's World of Horror. And now, let's get on to the episode. I inherited my father's cabin after his mysterious disappearance nearly eight years ago. He had bought it right after divorcing my mother. It meant a lot to him. It was a place of peace, sanctuary, and reflection. But how did he vanish, you might ask? I don't know. But I know what took him. The river near our cabin. That cursed river sits there day after day, night after night, flowing elegantly between the trees of the forest, masking the true darkness it holds, but I know the truth. I know that it is far from ordinary. Everyone calls me crazy when I tell them about it. My friends, my family, they turn their backs on it. None of them care to even try to get to the bottom of what's going on. This feels like the only place I can get my story out there without being considered another attention-seeking loon. There are times I consider getting my dad's old motorboat and taking a trip down the stream just out of burning and intense curiosity. But trust me, doing that without any sort of preparation almost seemed like a guaranteed way to make sure I disappear too. And it's not because of any current or conditions of water. There's something wrong with that stream, I just know it. I mean... Ever since I was sure it was the thing that took my dad, I've been studying it, spending every waking second I could to get some sort of proof that this body of water is not what it appears to be. Who was I going to show it to? Beats me. For starters, my dad's not the only one to have gone missing because of this wretched river. And no, I don't have some stack of newspapers detailing a bunch of missing persons cases. Instead, I have my own documentation and reports. Accounts that I've created of people disappearing to wherever that river leads. Believe me when I say I've tried to stop people from going boating or canoeing down that seemingly cursed route, but they never listen. Ignorance is bliss, I guess. So if the police, FBI, or government won't do anything about it, I will. They can keep pretending it doesn't exist all they want, but for the safety of myself, I won't be giving out any details of where I live or wherever that river is. I'll also be using made-up code names of individuals I mentioned for their privacy. Now, the government may look the other way when it comes to the river itself, but I know they'll be extremely giddy to come shut down any attempts to expose their negligence. I'm one man. I don't have the resources to fight back if they were to try anything. I need to make sure I can get this out there to as many people as possible while simultaneously keeping myself under the radar. So, without further ado, here's what I've gathered so far. Document 1, Jessica Stone, 22 years old and a college student. Jessica had been illegally camping outside in the forest near my home with a small group of college peers. Alcohol was present. A bonfire had been lit and a small-scale party had taken place. It was your typical scenario. The main portion of the campsite had been set up just feet away from the river, which was about 100 meters wide. Furthermore, the group had seemingly talked about having a normal night. No animal attacks, strange sounds, or weird phenomena. 
However, when the group had woken up the next day, Jessica had disappeared. They swept the area to the best of their ability, but found no direct or obvious clues. The police did no better, turning up nothing during two days of search efforts. Although, I was more than sure they were barely trying anyway. But after a few grieving members of the group had returned to the spot to see if they had missed anything, they had found the white gold necklace Jessica had been wearing on the night she disappeared. It had washed up on a nearby riverbank, only a few dozen feet away from the original campsite. The necklace itself was of great importance to Jessica. I mean, they told me she had worn it 24-7 and pretty much never took it off, so it was highly unlikely it was done voluntarily. Yet, there was no blood or signs indicating the necklace had been removed by force. As much as I wanted to ask for that necklace, I knew I couldn't. It'd be far too suspicious for what I was masking as a genuine conversation. Once they turned it into the police, no further clues were found from that point on. Several months went by and the investigation was closed. As I've stated before, I know full well the local law enforcement isn't doing their jobs. Not how they should, anyway. And whether they're being paid or threatened not to, it's no secret at this point, to me or to anyone. How do I know all this? Because I live here. I talk to the people who are involved with these incidents. Obviously keeping on the more casual side of things, not wanting them to know what I'm really up to, but everyone decides not to acknowledge or challenge the lack of authority's effort out of fear of consequences. That maybe they could end up being the next missing person, but I digress. Document 2. George Davis. 35 years old and unemployed. George, from what I gathered, was generally a pretty quiet and peaceful soul. His friend, who I will call Jared, had spoken to me not long ago. He had gone on about how he and George had decided to go for a short fishing trip to the river. George had brought along a hunting knife that belonged to his grandfather. It, similar to Jessica's necklace, had a lot of sentimental value to George. When he and both Jared had stayed out into the later hours of the boat trying to catch whatever was biting, both men had fallen asleep, but only Jared awoke. Jared had come to some time around dawn. He had seen that George was missing from the boat, but his fishing rod and prized hunting knife had been left where he was sitting. The boat itself had been floating near the dead center of the river, despite Jared claiming that he had been closer towards the east side of the stream the previous day. There wasn't a strong current or anything that would have moved it in that time period. Not that it's a completely impossible probability by any means. Of course, when Jared had attempted to contact the authorities, a similar scenario played out as the previous document's tale. The police found nothing because they were barely looking in the first place, only performing the bare minimum to convince the people that they were doing all they can. Document 3. Caden Waltz. 10 years old and homeschooled. From what his parents had told me, they had decided to take a small hike along the river with their son. Caden's father, Nick Waltz, was quite the nature buff, and had spontaneously brought them out to the area after convincing his wife that it would be a positive bonding experience. After hiking for only two hours, the family had encountered an abandoned motorboat resting on one of the riverbanks. Curiosity got the best of them, and they decided to explore what else might have been left with it. The father, Nick, had told his family to inform him of any weapons or firearms on the boat, not wanting his son or wife to get injured by anything dangerous. Near the back of the boat, Nick retrieved what looked to be a map. A very basic and simplistic brown stained paper with one dark blue wavy line drawn down the middle. At the top, in a poorly handwritten manner, was the sentence, Follow the stream to become fulfilled. Nick was hesitant to show his family at first, thinking it was nothing more than a drawing done by some small child. But the more he fixated on it, the more it seemed to pull him in and intrigue him. As if it were slowly bringing him into a trance of some sort. Caden, who had given up with searching the bow and proceeded to play with his yo-yo toy not too far from his parents, also became very intrigued about the bare-bones map he had seen his father inspecting. The yo-yo Caden had been fidgeting with was also of great significance to him, one that his father stated he had constantly had with him and almost never let out of his sight. Nonetheless, Nick had snapped out of his state of amazement by the map when his wife called his name several times. Nick had neglectfully dropped the map to the ground and left a spot to go speak with his wife. Not noticing that his son Caden had walked over, picked the map up, and put it in his pocket. The trip went on normally for the remainder of the time, all the way up until a strange smell had started to emerge. It didn't seem to have any direct source, it had practically come out of nowhere, much to the family's dismay. Well, the adults, anyway. 
Nick reported becoming dizzy and lightheaded, losing some of his coordination and possessing the constant feeling of being imbalanced. His wife had complained about a similar condition. They had both passed out within minutes. Just before losing consciousness, Nick had reported that Caden was highly concerned and had rushed over to him after he and his wife had collapsed onto the ground. But Caden was showing no signs of being affected by the smell the same way his parents were. When Nick had awoken, he went on how his wife was distressed and highly alarmed. She had informed him that Caden was gone, completely vanished with the only trace being the yo-yo left behind. Cops were called, nothing turned up, and everything seemed hopeless, which seems to be the recurring theme of these unfortunate stories. I know that some of you are left wondering, what valued item my father left behind when he had been taken by the river? Well, it wasn't obvious in the beginning. It's this cabin. Not only was it expensive as hell, but it represented great relief and independence for dad. A symbol that he was out of a hellish marriage, his words, not mine, with my mom and a free man. As to how I've spent so much time around the river and not been taken yet beats me. But I've come up with some possible theories. One, it's just simply not interested in me. I don't hold some great importance or purpose and it chooses to ignore me. Or two, it's waiting for the right time, for the perfect moment. As to why or when that is, I have absolutely no clue. The third, final, and most likely option is that I haven't triggered the particular event or circumstance that causes the disappearance. There are some specific criteria or prompts that activate whatever the heck is taking these people. After polishing up the papers and working tirelessly until nearly two in the morning, I was satisfied by what I had produced this far and decided I deserve a little reward. I grabbed my jacket, locked up the cabin, and got into my car, taking a trip to one of those 24-hour convenience stores they have in town. The drive wasn't long by any means, but I didn't live deep in the middle of nowhere like one might assume. I was actually relatively towards the edge of the wilderness, but I do have to be totally honest. Driving at night creeps me out, especially when I'm taking back roads or making my way in and out of the forest. Something about it just felt so unsettling. This night in particular was extremely quiet. No owls, no crickets, and especially no cars or people. It was that kind of silence where a pin dropping to the floor would startle you. I attempted to turn on the radio just for some extra noise to comfort myself, but every single channel gave me nothing but weird feedback sounds and nonsensical static noise. You've got to be kidding me, I huffed, leaning over to fidget with the radio. I know, I know, I should have been keeping my eyes on the road, but for the past eight years, most of my life had been nothing but working and overthinking, obsessing over something I had very little proof of. I needed some sort of way to enjoy myself and let loose every once in a while. So you can imagine why I was being foolishly dramatic. After messing with the radio for a couple more minutes while simultaneously navigating the road in front of me, nothing worked, so eventually I gave up and switched the whole thing off, but not without letting out an over-exaggerated sigh of bitter frustration to myself. I continued the rest of the trip in the eerie silence and made it to the store with no incident grabbed whatever sugary snacks or beverages I could get my hands on, and began the journey back home. The drive was no better than the original trip, because this time it wasn't just the deafening silence, but the feeling that I was being followed, watched, and stalked. I tried to chalk it up to me just being irrational, letting my imagination run to places it shouldn't, but the feeling of being watched is not easy to shake. Some people handle it better than others. I mean, when you live alone, you learn to get used to it. But this time, it, it felt too strong to ignore. I, I couldn't just brush it off. Soon enough, I came to an intersection, and when I looked up, the cold, unforgiving darkness of night stared back at me. Something else as well. In the shadows, I made out the silhouette of a woman. Yeah, a woman standing right in the middle of the empty intersection in my path. Her hair was done in a ponytail, she was neatly dressed in a feminine business suit. Her eyes pierced through a pair of prescription glasses. In her hands, she held a clipboard. A wide smile crept upon her face as my headlights engulfed her figure. I slammed on the brakes, my tires screeching obnoxiously against the asphalt of the road. The woman slowly approached my driver's side window. The sounds of her heels clicking as she marched forward filled my ears. 
Now that she was out of the way, I tried to hit the gas and go forward, but my car wouldn't budge. Frantically, I switched to reverse and tried to back up, only to receive the same result. I was stuck with no weapons in the car or anything to defend myself. The woman began calmly tapping on the windows, still maintaining that same endearing smile. She was patient, no banging on the glass, no screaming or frantic wailing. She was waiting on me to make a move out of my own free will, and from what I could tell, she was more than willing to do so. With a heavy sigh and hesitant movements, I reached over and cracked the window open just enough to be able to hear her. Who are you? I asked immediately, just waiting for her to slip up later some sort through the gap. What do you want? Where did you even come from? She held a finger to her lips and shushed me, right before slowly reaching into her jacket of her suit to retrieve something. I leaned back as a reflex, preparing for whatever weapon or device she planned to harm me with. Instead, she simply pulled out an envelope, a pristine, completely white one at that, and slipped it through the cracked open window. What the hell is this? I inquired, wrapping my fingers around the envelope and pulling it inside. She didn't answer my question. Instead, she simply straightened her posture, turned around, and began to walk away casually into the night, as if she had no time for questions. I stared at the envelope for a few moments, trying to determine what might be in it. I didn't plan to open it, I was mainly attempting to figure out whether or not I was in some sort of nightmare. So many questions raced across my mind. When I looked back, the woman had vanished. I honestly wasn't surprised. After everything that had happened around here in the past eight years, this almost seemed like something plausible. But I didn't care, I wasn't going to open the freaking envelope. Instead, I took a few more quick glances around, just to make sure the mysterious woman wasn't watching me. And with no hesitation, I rolled down the window a bit more and threw the dang thing out. I put the car back in drive, hit the gas, and jerked it forward. The vehicle was suddenly working again. I didn't sit around and celebrate, I just floored the pedal and got out of there as soon as possible. I could physically feel my fingers shaking on the steering wheel. I was completely unharmed and undamaged, but there was something more to that woman, I just knew it. She might even be connected to the river. I cracked open the Pepsi bottle I had bought and began to take a swig. The dopamine from the sugar didn't do much to help lighten my dread. When I arrived back at the cabin, I practically sprinted up the stairs to my doorstep, looking all around like some deranged mental patient as I fumbled with my keys. You know that feeling of being watched I mentioned earlier? It was increased tenfold now. Being outside made me feel vulnerable in a way I didn't think was possible. It was almost like I could feel my impending doom. My keys dropped to the ground in the chaos of my haste. I bent over to retrieve them and laid my eyes on a sight that froze my blood. There it was, lying there, staring back at me with a faceless but smug impression. The envelope. I didn't take my time. I grabbed the dang thing along with my keys, unlocked the door, and threw myself inside. I took a quick, final glance out into the nighttime darkness before slamming the door, making sure to deadbolt it as an extra layer of security. I walked over and placed the envelope on my kitchen counter and just stared. Stared and stared, just waiting for something to happen, something horrendous, awful, horrifying. I'm no fool. I know what would happen if I were to try to dispose of it again. It'll just come right back. Over and over until I finally open it. So, I did what I felt like was my only choice. Hesitantly, walking over to the counter and grabbing it once again. I held it out as far in front of me as possible as I turned the flap. Inside was what looked like a brown piece of paper. It looked old. Far older than anything I've seen in the past few decades. I retrieved the paper and opened it up. It was stained and beat up, looking like it had been folded and crumpled multiple times over. All sorts of creases and stains were spread across it. In the middle was a blue line. Going in a slight zigzag pattern along the vertical dimensions of the paper. At the top, in black ink, was one simple sentence. Follow the stream to become fulfilled. I quickly put the map back down on the counter. 
stepping back and taking several deep breaths. Everything in my head told me to deny the reality in front of me. To laugh it off as nothing more than some sick joke or warped dream. But I knew the truth and I hated that I did. So I know what must happen. I know what I must do. What was once the unthinkable now seemed like the only next logical step. I had to follow the river. Just thinking of that phrase made my stomach churn. But of course, not without preparation, not without planning or contingency in mind. I knew I couldn't start that night. I was already mentally and emotionally exhausted from everything I'd endured. I needed to sleep, regroup my emotions, and begin my mission in the morning. It wasn't long before I passed out after collapsing in my bed, even with a paranoia running through my mind. I couldn't even remember what I had dreamt about, which was rare for me. I woke up to the sounds of birds chirping and the sunlight beaming through my bedroom window. Usually it was comforting, but not today. I forced myself out of bed as I rubbed the morning grog away. I need to get moving as soon as possible while I still have the daylight. This nightmare wasn't going to end until I did something about it. No matter where I went or how far I was, it would never let me go. I had to face it head on. I'm well aware I might be injured or worse, but for eight long years, the question of what this has been has been tormenting me, taunting me, and never letting me live my life the way I truly wanted. I needed answers, and I I just wouldn't get them, sitting here in this cabin writing up documents about other people's grim fates. First, I put together a homemade gas mask in case I encountered the airborne substance that created the strange smell. From what the Waltz family document said, it didn't seem like it was fatal, but I wasn't willing to take a chance on it. Next, I brought a solid oak baseball bat. It was currently my best weapon of defense. I'd never been a big fan of guns in my life, but that's a story for another time. And third, I brought along a cooler filled with water bottles and non-perishable foods in the event that I got stranded or stuck far away from home. I was almost sure there would be no signal where I was going. And while you don't need a signal to call the cops, I'm sure you're already aware about how I feel. Finally, I went down into the garage and finished out my dad's old motorboat, checked for any signs of holes or damages that could end me at the bottom of a river, and patched it all up. As I was working, a car had pulled up into my driveway. It was one I'd recognized from before. At least I remember the person inside the vehicle. Nick Waltz. He got out, eyeing me, as he slowly marched up towards the cabin. Dressed in stained jeans, a pair of brown working boots, a black jacket, and a red baseball cap on top. He approached me with a look of complete and utter disbelief, as if he had just witnessed something impossible take place right in front of him. We need to talk, he said surprisingly calm, considering his expression and posture. I'm a little busy, I shot back, still looking him in the eyes as I leaned my head into the boat. No, you don't get it, he went on. It's about, you know, Nick announced, shooting a glance past me and over toward the river. I perked my head up. I didn't blame him for his more fragile state. He was a grieving father, after all. I was a similar way after what had happened to my dad, although I had a hard time comparing the two. I know you'd be doing this. Right now, at this exact time, I I saw it, I dreamed about it, he told me. I paused, a revelation boiling in my head, knowing there was no possible way he could have figured this out on his own. Did you... did you see her too? I asked. Nick slowly nodded his head. Listen, I know we talked before so you could get my story... The cops aren't doing their jobs around here. Everyone and their damn mother knows it. I I need your help. I just want my son. I want to find my boy. His voice cracked as he said it. I walked over closer as I dropped my tools. Tears were pounding at the back of his eyes as he attempted to keep his composure. What did she say to you? Did she give you anything? I inquired as politely as possible. She told me I I needed to follow the stream. She said it's the only way I can find peace. Call me a dummy all you want, but if that means I can find Caden, I I have to try. 
even if it's the slimmest chance possible, my wife and I can't take it anymore. The quiet emptiness of the house, walking into his bedroom and seeing his toys all over the floor, knowing he isn't there to ever play with them again. I need him back, I'm telling you, I need him back. I gently wrapped my arms around the distraught man, patting his back as he began to quietly sob on my shoulder. I could feel the warmth of his tears running down the fabric of my shirt. We're going to make this right, I said gently. I promise. We looked back behind Nick. In his car, I spotted what looked like a concealed hunting rifle in a case. Now, while I didn't like guns, I knew that this was worth bringing. Especially since I wasn't going to be doing the one shooting. I comforted him, man to man, for a few more moments before Nick was able to just about pull himself together. Not that I was going to rush him. You a good shot with that? I asked, pointing to the rifle in the back seat. Uh, yeah, I hunt pretty regularly. Was planning on taking Caden for his 11th birthday. He confirmed, wiping away the last of his tears. Bring it. I can't shoot, and I need someone who can. I stated matter-of-factly. I made another one of my homemade gas masks for Nick. Stocked up the cooler a little bit more, and he even helped me fix up the bow. I'll be honest and say I'm not sure how effective the mask itself would be, but it was still a worthwhile precaution. Once everything was set in place out in the front, it was nearly 3 p.m. Nick helped carry everything we needed down to the riverbank closest to my cabin. Nick looked at me as we set down all the equipment, now flashing me a friendly smirk. Hey, I just want to say thank you. If we make it out of this with our hearts beating, I owe you big time, he said gratefully. Another one of those rare instances of me smiling took place as I responded. The only thing you owe me is your happiness when we find your boy, I nodded. We set off not long after, both trying to display the looks of confidence at what situation laid out in front of us, but for once I felt good, great even, finally facing down the fear that had taken control of my life for so long. But like that night, I had encountered the lady in the business suit. It soon fell silent as the evening moved forward. The same disturbing silence. I could tell Nick was tense. He clutched his rifle tightly as he scanned the trees on either side, determined to find some sort of clue or sign for where these people went. You see anything? I quizzed while steering the boat forward. Nothing but trees, grass, and rocks. So far it's a dud. Just keep looking, I said. I promise we'll come across something. The water itself was calm, bubbling and foaming up as the boat glided elegantly along the surface. Despite the fact that we had been out there for a couple of hours with no results, I still held on to hope as much as I could, for both of us. Especially for Nick, he was in dire need of it. Watching a grown, presumably hardened man like him cry made you do a double take. Life can be cruel no matter who you are or where you come from. Everyone has their own struggles and demons to fight. Then, a burning question suddenly hit me like a semi. Hey, Nick? I grilled. Yeah? He replied without turning around. What would you say is your most prized possession? He paused, not knowing how to answer at first. We talking items or people? Big difference. Just anything, anything you can think of. Well, then that would be my family, he huffed bluntly. My wife and my son. Well, I was wondering because when I looked over the disappearances, I noticed that everyone who had vanished left behind something. My sentence was suddenly cut off by the tipping and turning of our boat. Something was shaking and rocking it from below. I quickly peered over, thinking it might have been a current that picked up, but no. It was something else entirely, something I couldn't see. Nick and I both held on to whatever we could for balance as we were rocked violently from side to side. Whatever was causing the chaos threatened to capsize the boat at the rate we were going at. What the hell? Nick shouted as he attempted to grab onto his rifle. I tried to go forward but nearly lost my balance as I stepped over the, one of the benches in the cockpit. What is this? I exclaimed, holding onto one left side of the boat for dear life as we were thrashed around. When the boat tipped onto its right side while I held the left, I caught glimpse of a group of figures standing in the forest directly in front of me. They appeared human, or so I thought, and they simply stared at us as we were going through the anarchy. 
Their only movements consisted of them all raising their right hands and waving slowly in our direction, as if it were a hospital greeting. Nick, can you grab me the rifle? I erupted, trying to overpower the disordered noise with my voice. I'm trying, I can't get to it, he yelled back. And then it all came to a halt when whatever was pushing us side to side had enough and the boat was completely tipped over, sending Nick and I plummeting straight into the river below. The odd thing is, I didn't feel my body break the surface of the water before I blacked out. When I came to, I was in a field. A simple field of nothing but well-cut grass. The smell of a freshly mowed lawn speeding into my nostrils. I wasn't wet like I thought I'd be. There wasn't a single drop of water on me. Nick? I called out. Nick! No response. He was nowhere in sight. All I could see was the grass in front of me. That was until a feminine voice from behind caused me to turn around. You made it. There stood the woman from the night on the road, still dressed the same way, not a single wrinkle on her suit or blemish on her skin, her ponytail still hanging down her back. You, I growled, now starting to become furious. She held up a hand, signaling me to calm down, clearly not frightened, but instead apathetic to my threatening tone. I know you have a lot of questions, sir. Yeah, you're damn right I have questions. Where is Nick? Where is my- She put a finger to my lips in order to shush me. I can assure you that Nick is okay. In fact, he's doing quite all right. He's already living out his fulfillment, she told me with an almost maternal tone. What is that supposed to mean? What even is this? Behind her, I was completely taken aback by the sight of a massive, grand doys looking cabin. It- made the one I lived in look like nothing more than a poorly crafted dollhouse. You see, your father has been here. That's what you were going to ask earlier, isn't it? He's been waiting patiently for you to finally arrive for quite some time now. But now that you're here, you can finally be fulfilled like him. In exchange for something precious. Something that holds a lot of value in your life. And what would that be? I inquired hesitantly. Your cynicism. And why that you may ask. Because all your life you have used it to deny yourself of so many opportunities and wonders that existence holds. A web of exciting friendships, romances, and careers. You see your emotional unavailability as a shield to avoid the responsibility of taking on new challenges, but in reality it's a curse. Not only to you, but those whom you care about deeply. Most of those who came here need to leave behind a relic of their maternal lives, regardless of its sentimental value. You have to let go of the issues of the past in order to move on to a bright future. I didn't leave my cynicism behind, I said using my fingers to create air quotes. Sure you did. And it was that exact moment you agreed to help a grieving father find his son. You were always determined, but that was out of paranoia and even sometimes malice. But today, you were determined out of pure compassion and human decency. You hoped for the best and were sure everything would go your way, that, that the world was on your side. That's far from what a cynic would think. I stood there, dumbfounded. She was right. I had been pretty bitter not only for the past eight years, but all my life. I was usually the person who hated to admit when I was wrong, but this time it felt appropriate to me. Well, if I left that behind, then, then what did Nick? His wife, she said bluntly. The most important thing to him besides his son, but in due time I'm sure she'll seek him out and join her family in their own paradise. I darted my eyes around quickly before looking back at her. Now wanting to ask the most obvious question of all. Is this... Heaven? The woman simply smiled as she gripped her clipboard, not able to contain her joy. You will see all the answers in due time. But for now, would you like to see your father again? I immediately nodded and began to walk over to the grand estate that was the cabin. The luscious grass leading my way as the smell of flowers from the garden engulfed me. The front door swung open and stepped the man I would thought I'd never see again. Mark? Is that you? He stumbled, his teeth showing as his lips curled into a warming grin. Dad, it's me. I, the river. I followed the river. 
He immediately he sprinted at me, his body being in much more pristine condition than what it was before he originally disappeared, but none of that mattered anymore. We embraced each other as father and son. He practically bear-hugged me and spun me around, yelling loudly in the emotion of pure and utter amazement. I missed you, Dad, I said softly, barely being able to even contain my own tears. I bet I missed you more, son. Come on inside, I'll get you a coffee. I looked at my father straight in his eyes. It was almost like I could feel the happiness pulling itself up in my chest. Everything I truly wanted, what I had been searching for, it was finally here. That sounds great, I told him, going in for yet another hug. I turned over to the woman in the suit, flashing her a smile and waving before mouthing the words, Thank you. Janine sat as silently as she could, hunched over her laptop, listening to the rain tap the outside of the cafe, like a billion tiny fingers trying her best not to let the dim, blue glow of her screen lull her into a comfortable trance. But she couldn't do that, not when he was watching her. He had been watching her for a while now. She didn't know when he had actually entered the cafe, but she had felt his glaze lying cold and heavy on the back of her neck for several hours. Janine was not the type of person who could relax and enjoy a day. She didn't celebrate life for what it was or live for the now or any of that. No, Janine was a warrior, had been since she was young. Janine often felt like she was the only sane person in her small circle of associates. She would never call them friends. They were happy, brash, and confident ready to attack life with a kind of vigor she could only truly wish to muster. She always wondered why they couldn't see what she saw. Murder, rape, economic collapse, droughts, rampant racism, and corruption that had latched onto every facet of government like a leech. How could they be so upbeat, so happy when the world they lived in was falling to pieces, rotting and caving in like the belly of something dead? Janine had become so overwhelmed by what was happening around her that she now rarely left her home. She secluded herself away from the outside and its disgusting reality, first trying to cope with the isolation by chatting with people online. When that failed to alleviate her loneliness, she turned to TV and her gaming systems, but what little entertainment they offered soon soured under her fears, so she had opted down pills, drink profusely, and sleep as much as she could in between brief surges of managing her little website whittling away the days until... Until what? No, she knew what, she just couldn't bring herself to think on it at the moment. Really, this trip to the cafe, the first in a very long time, was just her way of testing the waters, hoping against hope that the world has changed in the time she's been away. But the grit and grime that covered her little urban sprawl hadn't been washed away with the rain. The news was still bad, the people were still desensitized and crass, the air still stank of fumes, it was really hopeless. Janine heard a car alarm go off somewhere in the distance. The sound made her wince and she felt herself mentally taking check of her own body to ward off the fear that was boiling in her gut like bile. Her body was wasted from lack of decent food, her skin was pale from the lack of sun, and her hair was greasy. She knew that she smelled ripe like feet and spoiled milk, but she could taste what she had eaten three days before, concealing between her yellow teeth. And that was just the outside. Janine knew that she was faring even worse just beneath the surface. Her stomach felt deflated, shot through with the occasional pain of hunger or indigestion. Her eyes ached constantly. Her gums ached and her libido had long since failed her. She was a dying machine and she knew it and she wondered if he knew it too. She chanced to look over at her laptop and she shuddered. He hadn't moved an inch since he had her last looked. His eyes, pale and dull and utterly lifeless, were still fixed on her. He was seated almost at the opposite side of the cafe, his lanky frame clothed in a gray hoodie and white sweatpants, his feet shod in what looked like white socks of some kind. 
Janine wondered if the waitress or someone in charge would come over to evict him for defying their no shoot, no shirt, no service policy, but she highly doubted that anyone would want to get close enough to try. Even from across the way, Janine could still tell that there was something deeply wrong about this man. The boneless way his head lolled to one side, the other stillness of his posture that was only rarely broken by a low, silent breath. The way he never once spoke or even acknowledged the people around him. And then there was his face. Janine wasn't quite sure if it was a trick of the light or her own tired eyes, maybe the remnants of the pills in her blood or some combination thereof, but it seemed to her as though the man was deformed in some subtle way. The face lacked any facial hair. Even his brows were bare. His skin was pale and clean and utterly devoid of blemishes like the face of a newborn. His nose seemed to be small and flat. His eyes were perfect ovals with wet, gray orbs set in fleshy sockets, and his lips were thin and colorless. All of those features were worrying enough, but there was something else that unnerved Janine on a far more primal level. In the entire time that he had been staring at her, the man hadn't smiled or frowned, hadn't parted his lips to breathe, hadn't flared his nostrils, hadn't even blinked. He only stared. Those icy, stagnant water eyes of his bored into her from across the room. Studying her, judging her, sizing her up, it was the kind of gaze that she always thought a rapist or a serial spree killer might give a potential target. And yet there was no lust in those eyes, no invest, no mirth, just something that she couldn't grasp. Something small and half submerged within those eyes of his, like the slimy end of a worm in the mud. Outside, the rainfall intensified. A man shouted for a cab. A woman screamed at someone whose response was lost in a clap of thunder. And the man's gaze stayed on her, never wavering. I have to leave, Janine thought, feeling the suffocating grasp of oncoming panic beginning to tighten around her neck. She shut her laptop, wincing at how loud the click of plastic on plastic seemed to reverberate off the tiled walls of the cafe. She stood up, tucked her $600 distraction into her backpack, and walked toward the front door with as much haste as she dared show. The man followed her tentative, stiff movements with his dull eyes that never blinked. She opened the door and stepped out into the rainy night, glad to be free of his gaze. The rain was refreshingly cold against her warm skin, but... Janine found little pleasure in the chill. She was a woman, out alone at night in the vast, dark city. A city which stank of smog and fumes and this collective funk of thousands of sweating humans clustered together. She wondered if the stink would stick to her skin, if it would ever come off. She had tried to be more considerate, had tried to find one small speck of light in this gloom, but the foul stench that invaded her nostrils, the piss-tasting coffee at the cafe, the constant noise, and the frightening gaze of the smooth-faced man had proven to her once and for all. She was living in an abattoir. I might as well just leave, she thought, briefly allowing herself to envision her smiling doppelganger, riding away from the filthy metropolis in her beat-up Chevy, the sickness in her body being blown away in the fresh rural breeze. But no. She knew that those places held their own dangers too. There were no safe havens in the world. Slap, 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 slap. She stopped in her tracks. Slap, 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 slap. It sounded like bare feet on the concrete, but... Who would be out here in this weather without shoes? Slap, 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 slap. Probably some druggie, she thought. Her mind immediately conjuring an image of a wasted, dirty person in ragged, crime-encrusted clothing reaching out with a gnarled, grunchy hand with entreaties for change uttered from between missing teeth. Slap, 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 slap. Janine began to pick up her pace, but... To her horror, she found that her withered, nutrient-starved muscles had not yet adjusted to their renewed usage. Slap, 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 slap. I can't turn around, she thought. If it were some bum or junkie, they would have called out already. This... this is something else. 
The thought quickened her heart, sent nausea rolling through her stomach, and tightened her throat at the same time. All of the images that she had come across that had kept her up at night, all the reports and news stories that she had read despite her knowing that it would add more weight to her already fracturing spirit all came rushing back to her like a tidal wave. Slap, 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 slap. She turned the corner and forced herself to run despite the sudden pain that the movement brought. As she did, she turned and gazed behind her. There, still following at the same pace as before, bathed in the eerie, gaudy hues of a dozen neon lights, was the smooth-faced man from the cafe. His pale skin and eyes glowing in the dimness like some aberrant fish from the darkest depths of the ocean. Slap, 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 slap. He wasn't wearing socks, thought Janine, a hysteria-laced giggle warming its way out from between her teeth. She ran faster, feeling her tendons burn and her lungs ache, but she didn't care. She had to get home. She was blind to the odd stares that the other people were giving her. She was deaf to the inquiries that some of them made, asking if she needed help. She just ran until her apartment came into view. She crashed through her door, inhaling the sour, stale smell of her apartment, as if she had been underwater and was just now tasting fresh air. She slammed the door shut, not caring about any complaints her neighbors might raise, and bolted every one of her many locks. When this task, made more arduous by the trembling in her limbs, was completed, Janine wobbled and stumbled over to her ratty couch and fell into the familiar comfort that the cushions provided. Her body was screaming at her, begging her mind for sleep, but her mind was overflowing with the possibilities of what could have happened to her. Brief flashes of her own screaming face and tearful pleading as the dead eyes gazed down at her from a smooth face. Janine knew the sleep would evade her this night, but she was almost glad for it. I know I'll have nightmares about this for a while, she thought. Maybe the sunrise will help me sleep. She gingerly propped herself up and looked out the window at the city skyline. The deep pitch black of the night was already beginning to give way to the light blue hues of dawn. Soon, the first traces of violet and purple would appear from over the horizon to herald the beginning of a new day. Having a trembling, teary sigh, Janine placed her head in her hands to vent out the night's terrors, hoping what warmth the sun could bring her would comfort her. She was in the process of wiping away the last of her tears when there came a knock at the door. Janine looked at the door at the many deadbolts and chains that hung from it and decided to chance a look. With a steadier step, she crossed the room and peered out through the keyhole, hoping that she wouldn't see the smooth-faced man on the other side. To her great relief, it was only Miss Wilkes, her neighbor from across the hall, a woman of 78 who owned a great deal more cats than the building code allowed for, and who often dropped by. Janine suspected to keep her company when others didn't. Janine? Are you all right, dear? She asked. Yeah, uh, you can go back to sleep. I'm sorry that I woke you, said Janine, trying to keep her exhaustion and fear out of her voice with the kind of practiced facade that only the truly depressed can master. There was a silence. Then Miss Wilkes said, Well, all right, but you do know that you can talk to me if you're feeling unwell, right? Janine felt her lips curl into a small but genuine smile as she replied, Thank you, and, and I will. Good night. Miss Wilkes returned her good night and shuffled back to her room, closing the door softly, letting a heavy silence fall. Janine sighed deeply and felt her way back to her couch. Her heart had stopped its mad tempo and her mind was already growing cloudy with a powerful urge to sleep. All around her, the silence was beginning to invade her limbs, cocooning her senses in a way that was almost comfortable. Just a little sleep. Maybe I can call the police tomorrow, she thought as her eyes began to slide closed. A noise muffled and faint, yet still close by, tore through the silence and forced Janine's eyes open. She sat bolt upright, feeling a tidal wave of dread sweep through her body. The sound came again, closer this time, close enough for her to realize that what she was hearing was undeniably real and not some figment of her overworked mind. But it wasn't the distinct sound of tiny rodent claws behind the plaster. It was something larger, something that made a dry, scraping sound like a reptile scuttling up a wall or slithering across the ground. 
Again, she heard it, this time growing closer as whatever it was circumvented the width of her apartment. Janine stood stock still, her limbs shaking, her hair pricking, her mouth chalky. The thing that was making the sound had made it to the far end of her room where her bed lay above a small grate. The air vent. Oh, please, God, no, thought Janine as the realization struck her, its horrible truth piercing through her logic and skewing her reality. She closed her eyes and held in her tears as the lid to the air vent fell to the floor with a clatter. She felt his gaze on the back of her neck even as his cold, horribly soft fingers wrapped around her throat. And as the smooth-faced man's grip began to tighten, grinding her vertebrae into powder and reducing the fine, delicate, latest work of her veins and muscle that lay beneath her skin into pulp, she smelled the familiar stench of mingling sweat, pollution, and cancerous smoke invade her nostrils. The police found her nearly a month later, with her throat crushed and her eyes wide and asphyxiated with pure terror. There were no fingerprints to be found, nor was there any saliva, hair follicles, or threads of clothing. Whatever had killed her had come in the night like a phantom and had left before sunrise. Hi everyone, thanks for listening to this episode and I really appreciate all your love and support. Paula Perez read all the stories in this episode because I've been out with a wicked cold and I felt like I've been dying <laughs> for the past week. But yeah, thank you everyone for sticking around and I'll be back on the next episode. I'll be reading Insane Asylum and Hospital Horror Stories. But anyways, if you're watching this on YouTube, drop a like, and if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or anywhere that's not a video, please share it around with your friends. I, I'd really appreciate it. Have a lovely night, and never forget, don't sleep tonight.